thank you very, very much uh, to each of the leaders who spoke. I had the privilege of being at the uh, forum earlier today. And uh, really, really interesting uh, what all of you are undertaking in your countries on the front lines of the climate crisis. And I've got to tell you, you've been so impressively uh, uh, patient and understanding uh, in ways that sometimes uh, really baffles me because uh, you have so many reasons to be angry and upset and, and disturbed about the lack of adequate response. And so I sympathize with the uh, efforts to try to draw attention to the special nature of Pacific Island states, vulnerable nations, uh, folks who are minuscule components, if any at all, <coughs> of the creation of this crisis. So we know where our work is cut out. We know what we have to do. Uh, and <coughs> I want to just emphasize to everybody uh, that in Dubai, and it's related to the oceans. There's no way to have a cogent, important, factual conversation about the oceans unless you are tying it into what is happening globally with respect to the climate crisis. The climate crisis is at the root of some of what is happening in the oceans. Certainly not the overfishing, which remains a critical a component of the mosaic we have to piece together to deal with the problem of the oceans. And, but the changing of the chemistry of the ocean uh, at an unbelievable speedy rate, the melting of ice and the melding of that cold water in the Arctic and Antarctic with the currents of the Earth, already scientists are warning us about potential catastrophic consequences of shifting in those currents, which for places, which for places that rely on the uh, Gulf Stream and so forth could be absolutely catastrophic. Can anybody here say with certainty that's not going to happen? When scientists are telling us it's possible, when we hear about the tipping points, the answer is no, we can't say with certainty it won't. What we can say with certainty is that if we don't do more than we are doing today, we will experience components of the worst consequences of the climate crisis, which the IPCC predicted with clarity in its 2018 report. So here we are uh, at the ninth out of 10 years conference with COVID to thank for the gap. Uh, but what has happened in the context of this conference is really absolutely extraordinary. And every single body ought to really celebrate that at this point since it's a 10th year. Uh, I was just told in a meeting I had earlier today with Jane Lepchenko, who has done so much to help push much of this agenda, that 47% of all of the implemented areas and MPAs of the world have been announced at these conferences. That is really remarkable, folks. Uh, and the fact is that these conferences have produced over 2,100 individual initiatives. Uh, and, and, you know, from the shipping initiative, the port state measures, I mean, countless efforts that are making a difference. And I have to tell you that. Uh, uh, I think there's a reason for everybody here to feel good, but we have to feel energized and motivated to still do more. Let me be specific. In Dubai, and I want to single one person out here who's a great friend of mine who I've worked with in these last years, Sue Beniaz, has done a great job of helping us to shape the outcomes of these uh, COPs. And I've had the pleasure of working with her in Paris, in Glasgow, in Sharm El Sheikh, and finally in Dubai. But here's why Dubai is important. In Paris, we took a gigantic step forward by getting all nations to agree we had to act. I'd be getting all nations to agree they would do an NDC. Everybody would come up with their own plan. The, the 
problem with that is that coming up with your own plan does not necessarily, as we know, mean you're going to meet the, the mark of what has to be done. And so finally, at Dubai, we have language that I believe changes the ballgame if we do one or two things, but only if we do those one or two. But here's why it changes the ballgame. For the first time, almost 200 nations signed on to transitioning away from fossil fuel in a fair, equitable, and orderly way, accelerating in this decade. In order to achieve net zero 2050, and some nations hadn't signed on to that, according to the science. According to the science is not a light throwaway phrase. It is the consensus of all about 1.5 degrees, which we know is in jeopardy. But now it is clear what we have to do. Why that is critical for the oceans, because you cannot solve the problem of the oceans unless you deal with the transition away. And you also can't deal with the climate challenges if you don't recognize what's happening with the ocean and move to deal with the challenges that are special to the ocean. So uh, I would just say to all of you, we managed to change the dynamic. China signed on at the Sunny Lands discussions to say that they are not only going to include all greenhouse gases in their NDC, which they didn't do before, which meant one of the largest you know, emitters of all emissions as well as of methane, which is 80 to 100 times more destructive than CO2, that now that has to be part of the largest emitters agenda as to how we're going to meet the goals. And secondly, saying we're going to accelerate in this decade is precisely the only way that we can meet the goals we need to meet. But it makes that poor possible if we do the things that we know how to do. Deploy the renewables, push on the clean energy, continue to do what we've done in the US with the IRA and, and, and forcing the agenda with respect to technology and other choices that we can make. So I just close by saying this to you. Uh, I think we're at a moment of decisiveness about this. We either make the choice to do what we know we have to do, or this is a phony process, it's Katie bar the door, we're not gonna win the battle. I don't mean that we're not, I'm just telling you, if we don't do the things we know how to do and can do, we don't win the battle. But we can't win this. It was interesting, this morning at one of the discussions we were having, several people commented, you know, you know our plight and we know our plight, but a lot of people don't have a clue what's happening. A lot of people in Athens today don't have a clue that this meeting is taking place. A lot of people in the world who are leaders don't have a clue of what is happening here and how important the difference could be. And so, hearkening back to experience that I had when I was a young person who returned from a war that I opposed and demonstrated and fought to end it, but also joined up with the first Earth Day with the effort to have the passage of an Equal Rights Amendment, with the effort to have an environmental movement that was able to do things. And so we passed the Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water, Marine Mammal Protection, Coastal Zone Management. We created the Environmental Protection Agency of our country. You know what, all, you know what made all of that happening? Citizens who stood up and rose up and marched and worked and organized and made the issue a voting issue. Climate was, to a degree, a voting issue in 2020. We have to ensure that all across the world, where more than 50 elections are going to be taking place in this next year, that we are taking our voices out of here and people are hearing the facts of what is happening in your country, that you are moving people, whole villages, shifting islands, that there's no such thing now as a normal high tide. You don't wait for a king tide, you get a tide that washes things out when it's high, normal high. So our mission has to be to, I think, embark on a global initiative 
to raise the profile of the connection between climate, ocean, food, sustenance, survival. Life itself is on the line. And if we're not good enough to communicate to people and rouse them to do what's necessary, shame on us. So I think that is the task. Uh, and I look forward to working with all of you who have been great partners in this endeavor for the last years. But now uh, it's really coming down to one thing. We don't have to fight for the guideline of what we need to do. We don't have to tell people that, you know, we have to pass at the next cop. We have to do things at the next cop, mind you. Don't believe it's not without a huge agenda. But the basic structure of what we need to do is clear. Transition away from fossil fuel, do the things that are necessary to implement all of the things we've said we'll do. And if we do that, we're no longer living in a vacuum. We get the job done. We could actually win this battle, but only if we use the tools we have, if we implement the way we know how, and if we follow the guideline of what was passed and agreed to at COP28, and if we do all of those 2,100, and we will add several hundred to them here in the next days here in Athens, uh, we can win this battle, and we could actually, I think, uh, create an incredible sense of possibility and goodwill for young folks across our nations all around the world who have serious doubts about whether adults are capable of being adults. So let's go out and get the job done. Thank you all, and thank you for my compass. Appreciate it.